let's get started, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I want to remind you that today we have a talk by uh, Isfaba. Uh, it's right after the lecture at 1.30. I'm going to go walk there directly. If you want to walk with me, we can go uh, together. And I highly recommending, recommend attending this talk. I expect it to be really good. And also on Friday, we have Zhao Feng Wu, who is a PhD student at MIT, who will also give a talk on large language models. As well, I expect it to be great, and I hope to see you uh, there as well. Uh, of course, this is not mandatory. This is not part of the course, but it is very related to the topics we were talking about. So if you are interested, I don't see why. And you have time, of course. I don't see why wouldn't you come. OK, so as promised, I told uh, that I will talk about projects. And um, let's let's do that first. Um, Okay, so this is a quite lengthy document with instructions. It has about eight pages. So first of all, don't let that intimidate you. It's long because there are three different options for the project and each one of them is uh, described. So you might be interested in just one of them. So you won't be, you know, you don't need exactly all the information that's written here, but I do recommend that you read everything uh, just in case, um, you know, it's helpful for deciding which options uh, you are gonna take. Um, first of all, on collaboration, I uh, allow you to do this uh, project as a team of two at most, or you can do it uh, independently. Uh, if you're working as a team of two, your project needs to scale accordingly. And also if you're working on your own, you can't do you know half impl implemented system and say, okay, this is as much as I could done given the, you know, the scope I have chosen. You need to choose the scope for your project appropriately. Uh, if you're working with another person, uh, you sh both of you should contribute to both the code, running of the experiments, and uh, to uh, the writing. So mm -hmm. I do not want one person to write and the other person to code and run experiments. So please do not do that. Um, you are free to discuss your project with anyone in the course, anyone outside of course, uh, but at the end, when it comes to writing the actual code and running experiment, you must do it. So no one else can write any code or run any experiments for you. If you use any external resources, as always, you need to clearly cite them. And I, if you're working on a project already with someone else and it involves some kind of NLP component, uh, that is okay with me as long as you are actually coding a part of that project on your own and person who is collaborating with you is willing to confirm to me in a written form that you have indeed did that. Whatever component you are saying you, you have implemented, um, um, yeah, they need to confirm that it's really just you who worked on that and they didn't write the code. Um, this concerns maybe people who are already working on some NLP projects in some way, especially PhD students. So, you know, uh, I, I want you to kind of make use of these projects for whatever goals you already have set for yourself. Are there any questions about collaboration? Okay. Um, I won't pause for a long time for questions just because there is a lot to go through. So if you have questions and I ask, go for it. Um, so the three options that you have, um, not three, uh, you have, uh, depending on whether you are grad or undergrad, um, two or three. So um, all students uh, have these two options. First, of, uh, first is reproducing an NLP paper, and I will explain what reproducing means. Uh, or pursuing original research on an NLP problem. So everyone in this room has an option to do uh, these two options. Only undergraduate students have the option to uh, do this uh, component uh, on uh, investigating data artifacts. Uh, we will give you a starter code. We'll give you some instructions. It's going to be more like one of the homeworks, but way bigger and more comprehensive and requiring uh, some write-up and so on. But compared to the first two projects, there is a little bit more guidance uh, for the for the third option as, as we are going to see. Okay, so let's go over uh, each one of these options to make sure they are clear. Uh, First one being reproducing a prior work. So here we are going to follow what this uh, very nice uh, challenge. I don't know whether you know about it. It's called a machine lear learning reproducibility challenge. And how this challenge came about is because um, 
people have seen that there is a little bit of reproducibility crisis in ML research, meaning very often you'll see a paper, published paper that says code base coming soon and it never comes, right? Um, and then you need to build on that system and you try to, um, you know, following their description of the system, you, you are coding it up and then you kind of cannot reach the results they have reported in the paper. There is always going to be like a small variance of results and that's fine, especially if it's a variance you're getting from running the system a couple of times uh, with different random seed. But if you have a big uh, notable significant difference, then um, this is bad because we have a published work that is not possible to reproduce. And this has been repeatedly observed because as you all know now with your homeworks, parameters really, hyperparameters really matter. And if you don't report every single one of the decisions you have made while developing your model, it might be really hard to reproduce them. I would say this uh, is still an issue, but it, it was way bigger issue when we didn't have pre-trained models because they showed more instability and more variation across, you know, different slight decisions we are making. But even with pre-trained models, there is uh, there is this issue. So organizers of this challenge wanted to, uh, you know, kind of contribute to the space by having people uh, re try to reproduce published works. And then, um, you know, if you win the challenge, uh, you get a very substantial number of Google Cloud credits. So if you want some GPUs, it's going to be like really nice if you win it. Um, I don't know whether that's still true this year. It was past year. And um, yeah, they, they in general want to uh, want to kind of um, provide more information about reproducibility, reproducibility in machine learning. So here in this project option, you're basically going to follow that as if you are submitting to this reproducibility challenge which means that you need to pick a published paper from top machine learning or NLP venue. I listed here um, all venues I deem that some NLP work could be published at, which we kind of see in the community as being a top conference or a journal. Um, have in mind that I do want you to have an NLP project, which means that it has to involve some kind of language. So if you want to work on purely computer vision paper, this is not an option for this course, okay? So as long as there is some text involved, you should be fine. Um, pro working on programming languages is also fine. Uh, it is not natural language, but today there is, you know, when we, I, I didn't even mention this, I think, when we pre-train language models today, part of our pre-training data is code as well. So we have mixed between natural and programming languages. And there is an interesting work that has shown that whenever you need more structured natural language tasks, having this uh, programming language data in your pre-training corpus is super helpful because the model learns something about, you know, structural reasoning uh, alike coding. Um, so just to repeat, natural and programming languages must be included in your pro project. Purely vision, purely audio works, uh, audio where audio doesn't have natural you know, language speech uh, are not um, acceptable. Okay, so I recommend that you look at more recent papers. They're going to be more surprising. They will probably be going to be harder to reproduce. So uh, this is probably a better place to start. So if you choose to go this route, you'll need to figure out which results you will want to reproduce. And then you need to tr find a code base. The best starting point is did the did, did, did the original authors release their code base? And if they have, you try to run it. And very often you will find all sorts of issues with like library dependencies, for example, hugging faces library change all the time because they're, everyone works on them. So even if the code was published a couple months ago, if you are using new hugging face version, um, things might be not running in the new hugging face version. And if the authors didn't report which version they have used, it might be really hard to reproduce. And here you might run into two like situations. Either you try this new code base, whatever code base you have found, and it works. You know, like in 30 minutes, you run it, you get the results. And this doesn't mean you have reproduced this work, and this doesn't make a project for this course. Um, another option is that, okay, you're trying and trying, and things are simply not working. 
Um, and there you need to kind of go into co implementing components on your own and trying to figure out, because not everything is gonna be described in the paper nicely. You need to kind of infer what you think are right decisions are when you are implementing. If you had, you know, run the code successfully in like a day, uh, you still can work on a reproducibility challenge. So I gave you an example over here of two of them. And I wanna talk about this one, which uh, students have done with me in my explainability course, where um, running the code, like running the, uh, this is very grainy. All right, whatever. Um, running the code base there, you know, like getting the uh, replication wasn't extremely hard, but there were more interesting question of how the results in that paper generalized to other model families, specifically in this paper, that we were reproducing, the um, original authors have used only proprietary uh, family of models developed in Anthropic. They didn't evaluate on any other models, but they have made uh, conclusions that sounded like uh, this should be valid for all language models. And here you can raise a legit question. Is it true that this finding is um, true for any language model? or is it true for that specific model? And you can run their experiment in their experimental setup on other language models and see whether you get uh, same uh, insights. Um, not always more data sets or more models is, is a reasonable gap. Sometimes people evaluate two to three models on a couple of data sets and then adding another model or another data set might not offer, like expectation might not be that the results might change, right? Because there has already been shown that they work on multiple models and multiple data sets. So you need to be cautious of whether your reproducibility study, whether um, you, know, you can extend the knowledge about the insights that someone has already uh, you know, uh, reported. Okay, and you know, I think oh, this is a great way, great way to do a project because you have some starting point, you have some initial model, initial data. Um, you just need to find like what what your angle is here. Run the code base, see whether you run into issues. If you don't run into issues, what other question would be interesting here to know about generalize how the the insights in the paper uh, generalize? And we will hold this projects to, to high standards. Um, so here I say, don't pick a paper where you can reproduce the network in 20 lines of PyTorch, tune hyperparameters, put your results in a table and declare victory. That's not a project that's going to be um, successful here. All right, any questions about reproducibility project option? Very well. So um, another option is to pick any kind of original research on NLP problem. Um, I give you here guidelines how you can go about it. It doesn't make sense for me to read everything here out loud. Uh, I think you have seen this kind of option in some uh, other course already here. You just need to find a topic of your liking, find uh, do the literature review, and find the gap of um, you know what you would ideally achieve and what you have right now in the literature and try to bridge that gap. So there has to be something that's missing given the, you know, uh, the literature. Um, here, there is a bunch of suggestions of kind of topics together with references that might be, you know, a good place to check out, to get inspired about the topic you might want to work on. Uh, please reach out to me as well. Uh, I won't give you like a concrete suggestion of what to do, but if you have some idea and you're not really sure about it, I'm happy to help you out with, uh, you know, defining your uh, proposal. And in for these two options, I mean, even for, for the third one as well, there isn't, uh, you don't need to submit a proposal or an intermediate report. So the only thing that's gonna be evaluated for projects is your final projects report which means that you are accountable for how you organize your time for your project. Um, you know, when there is a proposal and intermediate check, you have some kind of forcing functions to complete certain things. So be really aware that you need to organize yourselves and be accountable for doing things in a timely manner. 
That said, I did suggest some ways you can organize your time. Um, this week, I suggest that you first of all, choose an option. And if you are choosing either to work on a reproducibility or an open research problem, you should have some sense of what the topic is you're gonna work on. Uh, and of course, if you wanna work in a team of two, uh, which I think is always more fun and I you know, strongly recommend it, um, then you need to find, a, of course, a person to work with. And we can start on Piazza, just like a one you know, post for, uh, you know, uh, to have a place where you can uh, seek uh, partners. Next week, you should be doing your literature review. Um, when you do literature review, be mindful that you are going to report about literature review. So the way I like to uh, kind of structure literature review for me is actually in a table, like a Google spreadsheet, where each row is a paper and columns are like different dimension I deem useful or important for my project, um, whatever that could be. And then in the end, you find some similarities and some differences. It becomes easier to find what's shared about these papers and what all of these papers are missing. And that thing all of these papers are missing is usually what you are claiming to be the gap in the current literature that you deem to solve. So it kind of helps to find you know, similarities between and differences between uh, prior work. Importantly, uh, all of you are going to work on something computational and you need to find a good baseline system. So um, you can't do a project where you say, I'm going to do summarization and then use a summarization system from five years ago and say, eh, I improved over the system by using pre-trained language model. No, that's not great because we already know that. And we have a um, work and model that has already been trained in that fashion. So you need to find the state of the art approach. And I recommend that you uh, look for a state of the art approach where you ignore computational uh, resource limits or you know whether the models are open or closed source, just to be aware what's the best among all models. But in reality, all of you work in constrained computational setups. So then you can have, okay, this is the best we have achieved uh, in the community overall, but this is um, the best results we have with models I can personally train. And that's likely gonna be either a Llama 2, 7 billion or a bird like model. That's something you should kind of figure out next week. And then in the week after you should try your best effort to uh, run whatever the you know code base is. I do not recommend starting everything from scratch. Uh, use resources you have. It's better to start and more common in you know research to start with the code base you have. Uh, I also want to uh, remember that I have demoed you how to fine tune models with Hugging Face. You are definitely going to use, uh, I suppose, use a uh, Hugging Face as well. And uh, remember that I showed you that. What I kind of do when I am looking for, you know, if I can't find a, like another person's code base for the exact task I am interested in, I go to the examples in Transformers. So here, examples, we all like PyTorch. And then here you have a starter code for a bunch of um, task types. You find the one which is the most similar in your opinion to your task, and then you modify it uh, as it's necessary. So you, you like in this period, like in the last week of March, um, you should try to run some code. Uh, and there you might run into issues and in they, these issues might be major. You simply cannot reproduce results and you might pivot into something which is more like reproducibility uh, work where you're trying to uh, get the uh, results you know you should be getting. Um, if you get results fast, you can, uh, in the upcoming two weeks, do your exploration and you should leave a week for writing. In this like last week, you might like run some small, you know, wrapping up experiments, but block enough time for writing. Um, any questions about these first two options? Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, can you how uh, on that one processing for um or can it also be inclusive of uh, formal language processing? Um can you give me an example of formal language processing? Uh let's see. So I guess uh, 
computer programming for me. Mm -hmm. for yeah. Mathematics. Yeah, mathematics is also also great, especially if you have problems that involve a little bit of language, like you know, word uh, math problems. That that's gonna be great. Yeah, any kind of math related stuff is interesting because current large language models really are bad at uh, mathematical reasoning. So this is, yeah, this is very, you know, still very central to the NLP research, although it doesn't maybe necessarily seem so uh, immediately. So yeah, mathematical reasoning, logical reasoning, uh, programming languages are acceptable. Again, if you're unsure, just ask me. I I will let you know. Uh, don't risk it and you know work on something that's uh, that I would be um, not happy to see. Okay, so um, I will tell you the the criteria are set uh, lower here. Um, there are deliverables and uh, grading has multiple components to them, and I'm saying leave a week for writing because one component is writing. Check the examples I have linked in this document to see what kind of language I'm looking for. It should be very alike scientific writing. So uh, try to be as close as possible to how you would write a paper. Of course, you all, uh, most of you haven't written a paper before, so I don't expect the level of scientific writing uh, I would expect as a reviewer at a conference, of course. Uh, but Try to be more formal uh, instead of saying, ah, I run Python code and it crashed. It's, um, um, you know, there is another way of saying that, like uh, upon we have seen that, you know, um, there is some kind of issue here and we investigate it and then uh, find other things. Throughout this document, I mentioned that what are not good outcomes and being like, I tried this code, it crashed, that's it, bye is absolutely not acceptable as an outcome. It might happen that you do not get positive results and that's fine, um, but you should explain your reasoning behind things you have been trying and motivation should be solid. And it should, it should make me think, yeah, that's a reasonable thing you have tried and sure, it didn't work out. Um, there is a whole workshop in NLP called workshop on insights from negative results in NLP. I linked it here. I recommend looking at a few papers just to see how other people in a more formal setting are reporting their negative results. You might wonder why a workshop like that exists anyway. It's really hard to publish negative results because there is always a question of, do you have a bug? Have you tried enough? And so on. So it's a really, really hard. You need to have extremely comprehensive work to uh, convince uh, reviewers and the community that indeed that's a you know um, closed problem uh, in a way. Um, so because it's hard to publish at top conferences, at top main conferences, then um, this workshop has emerged as a, another venue to talk about these things. And it's honestly one of the best workshops at conferences because negative results are so interesting. They are counterintuitive. They really ask you to have a discussion with other person where positive results can be surprising, but are often like, okay, you have a solid motivation, you have a reasonable approach and it works and you're like, oh, happy that it worked, but um, it's more straightforward. All righty, so for undergraduate students only, there is also this third option and it revolves around stuff we have talked about in the last lecture between before the uh, you know, the midterm overview, where we talked about issues with evaluation and these problems of data artifacts, where there are these spurious correlations that have introduced in the data due to the way we annotated it, that the model can exploit to solve the task, uh, which is then solving the task for wrong reasons. And here you're going to explore that. We suggest you data sets to work on, and there are two parts to this uh, analysis of uh, yes, there is an artifact here uh, using methods that can tell you that an artifact exists. And then second part is fixing this artifact, data artifact. We again suggest you some ways you can approach this and you have flexibility of like choosing the data set, choosing analysis method, choosing a way to fix it and so on. So in a way it's different from other homeworks because there is way more flexibility in choosing the approach you wanna take um, and also you need to write it up, both your analysis and the um, 
fixing part. And you are going to as well be evaluated according to these criteria. So have that in uh, mind. There are other details here you should look into. We are going to give you a starting point, a starter code. We still didn't need to do some checks of this code. It should uh, hopefully we share it uh, by the end of Friday. Um, so I will I will update you as soon as there is uh, this code uh, available. All right. So again, I went over these things for you to be you know kind of aware of the options and timelines and you know grading criteria and so on. But please do read this carefully because there are many other details that are uh, still important. Please use of the office hours. Uh, if TAs are not sure, they will ask me, I will confirm. Uh, please, this is, a, this is a time to talk to us a lot. Uh, and you know, if you can't come to the office hours and the Piazza post, we can uh, chat offline. And then if uh, we see that we need a bigger discussion, we can uh, meet at uh, another time. All right, any questions about projects? All right, very well. Um, let's then go into our linguistic structure prediction. All right, so just a quick recap of what we have talked about uh, last time. So we started a new topic with linguistic structure prediction. We are giving our unstructured text as always. We are trying to find some uh, structure in from this text and then make predictions based on this structure. And right now we are just we are not talking about downstream tasks. We are talking only about what are these structures, how to how to build them. First thing we then introduced is two sequence labeling tasks. First, we have notion of what a sequence labeling task is. For a sequence of tokens, we have a sequence of uh, labels. So unlike before, where we had only one label per entire input text, now we have for every single token. And two examples of sequence labeling tasks that are related to linguistic structure predictions are part of speech tagging and NER named entity recognition. I didn't emphasize, but both POS and NER are established abbreviations, so you can use them and people will very likely know what you are referring to. POS tagging is the task of uh, assigning to each word their grammatical role in text, and NER is the task uh, where it's a little bit, uh, you should remember it goes uh, beyond sequence labeling, the goal is to extract all named entities in a given text, but very often in NLP, we approach it as a sequence labeling task. Um, and named entities with very vague definition, but we can basically uh, define whatever we want named entity to be, but very often it's something we can refer to, to uh, with the proper noun, such as organization, a place, a person, and so on. Unlike, um, for example, uh, in my PhD, I worked on resolving uh, pronouns like this and that, that very often refers to facts or, uh, you know, um, some larger piece of text uh, in a uh, larger piece of, of text in a given uh, text that's very often very abstract. It's not something you can assign to something you can actually imagine uh, in the world. And for NER, because um, very often, often named entities are multi-word expressions, we also needed to introduce the BIO notation, beginning inside, outside, to say, uh, okay, this is, uh, all of these words belong to a single entity. And then we said, okay, we could approach sequence labeling with our approaches that we have learned in the first part of this course. However, we want to extend our toolbox and we have started to uh, learn about hidden Markov model, another model which is takes uh, needs uh, data that's labeled. So a text where we have human annotated labels. So text where some person had annotated the part of speech tag for each word, for example. Um, but it doesn't rely on the on representation learning, meaning the representation of text is not learned in a automatic data-driven way, like with neural networks. And then based on the learned representation, you make a prediction. Rather here, we don't have that. Okay, and um, just to go 
All right, um, I will go into, today we are going to learn more about hidden Markov model and kind of wrap it up. Hopefully looking at time, not 100% sure. Um, but before all of that, I do want to clarify a few <laughs> things that um, I was a little bit hand way we were talking about other languages last time. So I just wanted to, um, yeah, clarify a few things from uh, the last time. Um, so I was saying, and uh, something like, oh, Korean doesn't have adjectives, and we can, you know, be more formal about this. In Korean, the words corresponding to English adjectives act as a subclasses of words, uh, verbs. So what is in English an adjective, let's say beautiful, uh, uh, in Korean would be a verb meaning to be beautiful. So there are these differences between, uh, you know, part how we use grammatical roles across different languages are going to be different. Um, I didn't mention these, but I just want to give a few examples how grammatical roles different, differ in different languages. So many scholars believe that all human languages have nouns and verbs, uh, but some other people, and you know, remember this as an example when I told you how we don't know everything about human language. It's science, right? Linguistics is a Science, uh, science of understanding human language. So while some scholars believe, okay, uh, every every language has categories of verbs and nouns, other uh, linguists believe that certain languages, such, such as, for example, Tongan, don't even have this distinction between verbs and nouns. And just an example from my own language, which you might have noticed, but because I don't really know how to use articles, but Croatian doesn't have articles before nouns. So we don't have, say, the and the noun or a and the noun we just don't have it um which is very challenging when you write and think thankfully there are writing <laughs> tools right now and i'm one of those people that always clicks so whatever was suggested <laughs> um also uh i talked a little bit about uh part of speech tagging for morphologically rich languages and i says i said that you need uh, this part of speech uh, tags, the given tag set has to be augmented. Um, here are just a kind of ordering of how many word token, um, how many types per given corpus uh, there are across uh, two languages. So in a 250,000 word token corpus of Hungarian, uh, we have twice uh, as many word types as a similarly sized corpus uh, in English. Remember types are unique tokens in a vocabulary to uh, tokens are their occurrences in text, and uh, and Turkish has four times as many uh, word types. And then this uh, results in challenges for the tasks like uh, part of speech tagging, and very often you will see that their tags that are enriched to have this uh, also this morphological tag. So here it's not just, for example, the Turkish word izin. No, it's not just the tag noun part of speech that we have here, but also some uh, morphological uh, tags uh, as well, which are necessary. So you will encounter that if you work with another language. And I think one of the projects that's going to be great if you want to explore it is look a little bit into this linguistic structure prediction, uh, but across languages, right? Because we didn't speak too much about it. Um, I mean, I'm trying to bring these examples, but there is way more you can uh, try it in your project. Um, and finally, just briefly, there was a question about what to do with languages that don't have clear word boundaries. Uh, and there, uh, I did a, just a little search of what people are doing. And it seems that the common approach is to first do word segmentation. And then once you have segmented characters, you know, into words, you do part of speech uh, tagging. But then there are other issues you need to handle uh, along the way. So it's definitely more challenging than part of speech tagging in English. But a lot of these languages still have part of speech tagging accuracy in you know, low 90s, which is still not too bad, right? But relative to English, which has 97%, it's not as nice, of course, but still it's not ridiculously hard task in other languages either. Okay, any questions about part of speech tagging and these new facts we learned? Very well, okay. So I wanna go over the uh, where we left off last time. First of all, I said one, um, um, one thing which might have confused you on a, this particular slide. I have, we have a sequence of tags. Um, 
here um, we will need for a hidden Markov model a uh, labeled data set. So we will need sequences and the task to tags, part of speech tags to learn the uh, parameters of the uh, HMM. However, for this particular slide here, we have um, just the inference basically. So here we are looking for the uh, a sequence of part of speech tags that maximizes the conditional probability of tags given observed words. And uh, we use our standard, you know, um, techniques to derive the final equation, uh, which re relies on introduced uh, matrices B, A, and the sequence uh, pi. So if we had values of B, A, and pi, what we could do then to find the uh, best sequence is try to run all possible part of speech uh, tags and then um, find the one which gives us the maximum probability, right? Um, do we envision any issues with that that immediately come to your mind? Just to repeat, we are gonna do maximization over all possible part of speech tag for a given sequence of words. Okay, I will leave you with that thought for a moment and you can kind of still contemplate about it. Another issue here, uh, let's say um, you want to do this. We are uh, doing this uh, argmax uh, optimization and I told you we have these values. Um, the, the issue right now is that we don't have, I didn't tell you what we place in these matrices, right? Uh, as always, this is our final model, but we first need to learn the parameters of the model and parameters of H and M are gonna be those value in A, B, and pi. So that's the first thing we are gonna talk about, but you still, if you have capacity to think about two things, two things uh, at the same time, you can think about what other issue there is uh, with trying to find the uh, maximum over all possible part of speech uh, tags. All right, but first let's try to find these values for A, B, and pi, which is parameter estimation for hidden Markov model. Oh no, didn't do the animation else nicely. All right, so how to calculate the values of P, uh, pi, A, and B from observations? And remember observations are a given sequence of words. There are two possible scenarios. You could uh, have uh, a data set where someone had a labeled part of speech tags for these observations. So we have our labeled data, which means that we are gonna do supervised machine learning, right? And we have so far in the course, talk, we have been talking only about supervised machine learning. We didn't really look into uh, much of unsupervised machine learning. And continuing with that trend, we hidden Markov model is still gonna be an example of supervised machine learning. And we are going to use a data set such as Pentry Bank um, to, to find uh, appropriate parameters. Another option is that you are given only sequence of observations, meaning words, and you want to find values of A, B, and pi. And this is gonna be unsupervised learning because we don't have human uh, annotated labels. And here you're gonna, if you if you if we would go this route, which we want, you would use a special case of the ex, uh, expectation maximization algorithm uh, that's used to find the unknown parameters for specifically hidden Markov model, and that algorithm is going to be called Baum Welsh algorithm because those people have found it. Um, expectation maximization algorithm very often referred to as EM algorithm, we are not gonna cover in this course. It has been very important before neural networks uh, and it was a part of the standard NLP curriculum. So I skipped over machine translation approaches before neural machine translation. But if we have gone into the details of the you know word level and phrase level alignment and all of that, that's where we would also use expectation maximization. So you might find it in different, you know, if you look at textbooks, it's gonna be definitely covered there. It, um, you know, it was an important algorithm and it might have its renaissance like many things end up 
uh, having uh, in uh, NLP, but we are not going to talk about it. So we are going to have a label data set of uh, words, a sequence of words, and their part of speech tag, for example, pen trip bag. And we are going to approach supervised learning of HHM by our maximum likelihood principle, meaning we have a data set of sequences of words with their sequences of part of speech tags. Uh, I'm using bold here to emphasize that these are sequences. So this is not a single number, this is a sequence of words and the same size sequence of part of speech tags. And we are, with the maximum likelihood principle, we are trying to find the values of A, B, and pi, such that we maximize the likelihood of seeing our sequences of words together with our sequences of part of speech tags. And as always in machine learning, we have IID assumption. We assume that these are independent events. Therefore, the probability of seeing all of these things together is the product of probabilities of each individual sequences. Um, we have seen before on the previous slide that this equals to, uh, to this, and except that now here you have the, um, you know, um, D, our, our size of our data set is D. So we have this outer product that goes over entire training data. And we are not gonna derive this. Uh, we kind of already use this, uh, what I'm gonna say uh, before, when we have talked about uh, language modeling, statistical language modeling, uh, we had similar derivations and we said relative frequencies are the way to maximize the likelihood of the data. So pi A and B can be estimated separately by counting on a tag training corpus. How many times? Ta a certain tag over here occurs with this word. How many time a tag uh, over here fall is a preceding tag over here? So we are doing these uh, counts to estimate what these values are gonna be. And I do not wanna go over these derivation, but remember they do not just come out of nowhere. There is a way to derive them and see that indeed these counts are gonna maximize uh, this uh, equation. If you like, you can derive them using the uh, gradient or derivatives of the log likelihood. And it's gonna require Lagrangian multipliers, which you might not be familiar with. And we don't wanna go into that level of machine learning details. Um, for me, it's important that you just know that uh, the fact that these counts are what maximizes the probability comes uh, from math not from me stating this. All right, so given a data set where we have sequences and uh, their tags, we are going to um, we are going to estimate the values of our uh, parameters of hidden Markov model pi a and b uh, by counting for pi how many times this starting token we have the special start thing is followed by the state T, where state is part of speech tag. So remember the uh, initial uh, distribution pi was uh, of the size of the number of states we have, which is the number of possible part of speech tags, right? So in Pentry Bank, we had something of the order 30, I don't know, I'll say 33. So it would be a distribution over 33 part of speech tags. And you check how many times each one of these part of speech tags is the first, um, a first, you know, a part of speech to occur in your label data for each one of the sentences. And then you are just going to normalize by the size of the data, by the size of the uh, input sequences you have. So can you tell me just your intuition? What kind of part of speech tag would should have a high probability here as an as an in, as a starting part of speech tag? Exactly, yeah. So we start very often words with like A or the, and then follow with the noun. What kind of part of speech tag you deem might not be the first one? In English. Verbs, yeah. Um, certain types of verbs, but there are many, there, there are many verbs that might be uh, less uh, likely. Um, 
adverbs especially, right? They often follow verbs. Uh, so we already have some intuition of how this could look like. Mm -hmm. Our matrix A is a matrix where we store uh, the probability that we are gonna end up in a state T given that we have pre previously been in a, a state T uh, prime. And here again, we are just counting how many times T is gonna follow, right? In our given uh, data set. So we check for the uh, part of speech sequences we have, how many times uh, the state follows the other divided by how many times we see that state. And similarly for, uh, for the counting, how many times uh, we are going to observe a state given a certain word. So this is how we estimate these parameters. And now remember, we have uh, now we have values in these uh, vectors and in this vector and in these matrices. And now if we are interested in finding the maximum, uh, in finding the sequence of part of speech tags that maximizes that likelihood. All we need to do is, um, uh, you know, calculate, multiply these numbers. So maybe I should go back um, to the, yeah, to, to the equation. So let me actually go to this one. Yeah, here. So now that we have estimated values of B, pi, and uh, uh, A from our data, uh, and we want to find the sequence that maximizes, uh, you know, this conditional probability given our observed words, we need to go over all possible uh, part of speech tag sequences and uh, calculate the value here. And then we will have for, let's say we have 100 possible part of speech uh, tag sequences. For each one of them, we will have one number here. And then we find which one is the maximum, and we say this is the part of speech uh, sequence sequence of part of speech tags we are predicting for a given sequence of words. Now that I said all of that, I'm going to go back to my question of whether you sense there is not necessarily issue, but something that might be tricky here. Please. Very good point. Uh, I should have mentioned that somewhere, and I think I even have it on slide. Not what I had in mind right now, but uh, thanks for reminding me. Yes, so as well with la la language modeling, we know that if there are very infrequent or unseen tags or combination of these, you know, uh, this tag following the other tag, then we will have a lot of zero values, and that's not nice, right? Um, so as we did with language modeling, we are going to do smoothing by adding small values to things that are unobserved over here. Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. What other issue do you... Again, it's not an issue as something is um, wrong with... Um, going over all possible part of speech uh, sequences and trying to find which one maximizes. Uh, but do we sense that, how do we feel about how fast this might be? Okay. So you all were thinking about it, but no one wanted to say. I see a lot of noting. And all right. So the issue with doing this, um, I'm gonna delete this just a moment. This is the thing that I had before that I don't like. Okay, so the issue here is that we need to calculate these values for all possible part of speech tag sequences. And depending on the length of our input, uh, each one of the words might have multiple, you know, there is the entire uh, entire part of speech tag set we consider to be possible. So just think about the combinatorial problem of how many possible tag sequences then there could be. And, you know, I have illustrations for this, so let's maybe go over them to, to make this point stronger. Um, 
All righty, so here, um, sorry guys, I need to remind myself how I wanna go about this. Okay, so I'm, I'm using VBEC slides, but um, I, I don't remember what exactly I wanted to say here. In the, the point I, I want to make is that given a sequence of words, and here we have five of them, uh, and given um, given a possible tag set, here we have only two possible tags, verb or a noun, you can have 16 possible sequences that you can check in that um, equation, right? But that's a really limited tag set, and in reality, we have way more. So, um, in, in a general case, um, we will have whatever is the number of possible state. Uh, so whatever is the size of our uh, tag set, 30, let's say, uh, to the power of sequence length. And here you wanna have maximum sequence length. Uh, these data sets are usually sentences, but they could be, let's say, 20 words long. So you have uh, 30 to the power of 20, um, sequences you need to check in that equation, meaning for that many sequences, you need to calculate this value and find which of these part of speech tag sequences maximizes that value. So very quickly, this becomes very slow, right? As soon as you have a reasonable tag set, a reasonable possible sequence length, this is, uh, this is very slow. So that's one naive approach. Um, which is correct. Like if we do this, we are gonna get the correct solution, but it's gonna be ridiculously slow. And then other option for how we could do, go about this inference is to be greedy and say, uh, well, I'm going to check just the, what is the best tag given the previously chosen tag and observed word. And um, this will result in uh, the uh, complexity of uh, that scales with the sequence length but it's going to be incorrect uh, because we are making a very uh, crude assumption. So what we are going to talk in the rest of this lecture is how to do inference of hidden Markov model uh, efficiently. But I do want to make sure because I, I, I kind of, well, it, this illustration was a little bit bumpy. So I want to make sure, and I'm going to skip this slide. I want to make sure that this uh, this is clear how this becomes slow. So please, um, it's my fault because I you know I forgot how I want to go uh, over the illustration. So maybe you lost me for a moment. And if you feel like that, I would love to go over it one more time just to be sure uh, you understand why this becomes very slow. Okay, seems like we we uh, got that point. All right, so what we're gonna do is take advantage of our first order Markov uh, assumption, take also the advantage of our output independence assumption, uh, which says that given the adjacent labels, the others do not uh, matter, which kind of suggests a recursive uh, algorithm. Um, so this is our goal uh, and we want to maximize this uh, probability. Uh, I apologize, there is now a switch in the notation. So let me just make sure that we are on the same page with the notation. So I have used W for words before. In these slides, uh, uh, Xs are used for words, for inputs, for observed things, and Is are used for tags, which I was denoting with D before because I was making slide specific to part of speech tagging. Um, everything else is the same. We have this, uh, initial probability of the first tag. We have here uh, the um, probabilities of going from one state to another, which were placed in our matrix A. And we have the probabilities of uh, given a tag of observing a word, which were in our matrix B. So what you see here is what you've seen before, just written differently. All right, and we want to find an assignment. Uh, previously, I was talking about a sequence of T's, now we are talking about sequence of I's that maximize uh, this uh, probability. All right. The first thing um, 
here is that uh, we just write, you know, instead of using the product sign, we write all of these things. And what you can then do uh, is um, move, oh God, sorry guys. Um, this always happens when I use someone else's slide, I, I get confused. All right, so what I want to say is that um, when you have this uh, maximization over here, you could first maximize by tag, uh, first tag. And the first tag, what depends on it is just these values over here, right? Other values do not depend on it because we are using the output independence in Markov assumption properties. So instead of looking at the entire history, we are looking only on the previous state and the previous observation, okay? So the fact that we moved the max over the first tag I1 uh, and left the maximization over I2 to IN comes from that assumption. Is that clear? Okay. And we could do this recursively, right? We understand that we could, now if we uh, do maximization over I2, the second tag, we would also move it at the uh, appropriate part of the equation and so on and so on. So what this kind of suggests and uh, that we should do is we should do some kind of dynamic programming here. We should define our base uh, case, score one, uh, which is the uh, probability of the initial state times conditional probability of the first word given the first uh, uh, first uh, state. And then the rest of these, you can um, you can uh, define uh, recursively, right? We have max given i i minus one, and then uh, these uh, conditional probability of a given state given this um, of a given, excuse me, a word given this uh, tag times this uh, conditional probability uh, here times our score. Okay, so there is a lot of slides here. The, the What I'm getting at is that here you have this, um, because we have used the output independence and uh, because we have used Markov assumption, we can define this first uh, base case and then find the scores for the rest uh, recursively, which is what I have said here. And then uh, your, your maximization problem turns into maximizing the score for the, uh, 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 for the end uh, position. All right. There is a lot of things here. What are, the last thing I want to say about this is about runtime complexity, which is somewhere in between those two things we have seen before. Before we have seen a uh, number of possible part of speech tags uh, to uh, the sequence length. And here we say sequence length nine times uh, square of possible states, which is uh, a big improvement. This algorithm is called the Turbis algorithm uh, named by a person that, he's, uh, that has discovered it, Andrew Viterbi. Um, and the goal of it, just to repeat is is to make efficient inference for hidden Markov uh, model. Now we would use this uh, dynamic programming algorithm to find the sequence of part of speech tags that maximizes that uh, probability instead of doing the uh, naive approach of trying to you know run all possible sequences which would last uh, for way too long. Okay, are there any questions about the Viterbi's algorithm? Good, okay. So I will stop here. We will finish early today because we have uh, the talk at 1.30. So maybe uh, we wanna take a little break before that starts. Uh, I hope to see you all there if you can come. I really can't emphasize enough that I expect it to be a great and useful talk. Um, and start thinking about your projects and please reach out early about any doubts, questions you have about them. And you know, don't forget that you're accountable for the timeline 
and um, don't wait for too long to you know start working on this. All right, uh, any questions before we leave? 